is it recording? Yes. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Navid Fozi, the interim director of the Middle East and North Africa Studies here at Bridgewater State University. I'm delighted to welcome my dear colleague and friend, Dr. Matthew Weiss from the great state of Nevada. And also, I would like to thank Dr. Michael Zimmerman and his students in the anthropology class 216 Anthropology of the Middle East for hosting this class and opening your class to the campus community. Before I introduce our guest speaker, let me share my screen and make a couple of announcements. The first thing that I want to share is the pamphlet or flyer of our Global Scholar Series for this spring. As you see, we are here today, and I will introduce Dr. Weiss shortly. The next event is on China and Turkey relations, and the last two events are on Iran. And if you click on this link here, it will take you to our webpage, which is a fabulous page with lots of resources. If you want to do research, there are resources here that you can use, but also you see our events here and you can learn more about each speaker and each topic. I will be also sharing the upcoming flyers. I put them in the chat. This is the next one. And we have two other events, three other events actually. We have a book launch that Dr. Jackie Bowen will uh, introduce the book with the co-editor of the book. And also the last talk of the semester here. I will put all these flyers in the chat, uh, but before introducing our speaker, let me thank our co-sponsors in particular, uh, the Department of Education, uh, we are using their grant and we have to acknowledge that they are supporting these series. And now I'm going to introduce Dr. Weiss. <clears throat> Dr. Matthew Weiss is a full-time political science instructor at the College of Southern Nevada, uh, located in Las Vegas. Previously, he was an assistant professor in the Department of Public Affairs and Security Studies at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, where he taught classes for both the undergraduate minor and the Masters of Public Affairs program in Global Security Studies. From 2011 to 2012, he served as a postdoctoral research fellow at the Middle East Institute of the National University of Singapore, Dr. Weiss obtained his PhD in political science from the University of California, Davis in 2011. His primary research and teaching interests center around international relations, Middle East politics, American government, and non-traditional security issues. Dr. Weiss has published articles in a variety of journals concerning Turkish foreign policy, Turkish-Kurdish relations, cooperation and conflict over international river basins and water scarcity and conflict in Yemen, the topic that we are going to listen to today. I hand it to you, Dr. Weiss, the floor is yours. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Dr. Fozzi and Dr. Zimmerman for having me. It's, it's, it's quite an honor. Um, I've known Dr. Fozzi all the way back, uh, dating back to when we were both serving as postdoctoral research fellows at uh, uh, the Middle East Institute of the National University of Singapore. And this is uh, the first occasion where I've been able to interact with Dr. Fozzi, uh, either virtually or in person. So it's kind of a reunion of sorts. Um, and also, uh, even though I'm now working and living in, in Nevada with my family, very, very far away from Massachusetts, uh, you know, undoubtedly, I do have some connection to New England. This has nothing to do with my talk, but uh, I did live in New Hampshire with my family for a couple of years and we still have a home there. So you could say that the whole New England region is very near and dear to me, but for all of your sake, I sure hope it warms up there quickly. 
Looks like it was still pretty cold uh, through yesterday. But in any case, um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, water scarcity and conflict in Yemen. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, open up the, the slide, uh, my slides right now. Let me just go ahead and, uh, okay, here we go. I'm more of an MS Teams than a Zoom guy, but it, it should be fine. Um, let me just see. Here. Oh, okay, wait, it's paused. Hold on. Uh, stop share. Let, let me do this again here. I think I just misclicked once. Okay. Thank you for your patience here. It shouldn't be long. And let me maximize this. Uh oh, what do I keep doing? I think I'm pressing too hard or something. Sorry. Okay, let's see. So now share. Now, let's see. Are you seeing the screen? Yes, we do see the screen. The only thing maybe you need to go to slideshow. Okay, let me see. Um, okay, slideshow one. Because I'm clicking and then it's minimizing on my end. I don't know why it's doing that. Uh, let's see. What if I click inside of here? This isn't what we were doing in the little dress rehearsal we had. Okay, there we go. Let's see if it's now. Now, everything Perfect. fine? Oh, great. Okay. Shoot. All right. Anyway, so we're going to be talking about water scarcity and conflict in Yemen, depending upon, um, you know, how much time I have to get through all this. Basically, first, I'm going to be talking about the dimensions of the water scarcity crisis in Yemen, just trying to illustrate just how uh, big of a problem it is in terms of magnitude. Um, and then I'm going to be talking about some of the contributing factors uh, to water scarcity and conflict over scarce water resources in Yemen, uh, which was largely taken from the research that I conducted dating back all the way to the time I served as a postdoctoral research fellow uh, in Singapore over 10 years ago. Uh, then I'm gonna be talking about shifting gears to talking about the civil war and about how that's um, unfortunately and tragically greatly exacerbated all of the pre-existing problems uh, with water governance in Yemen and, and, you know, due to the damage and destruction of water networks even made uh, the situation far more grave than it already was. Um, and then trying to sketch out a little bit uh, some, some thoughts about whether and to what extent did water scarcity contribute to the civil war in Yemen. It was by no means the definitive cause or even one of the primary causes, but it didn't play any role whatsoever. It hasn't played any role. So with that said, um, I just want to talk first about uh, the dimensions of the water crisis in Yemen. Uh, it uh, goes without saying that Yemen faces a crisis of dire proportions. Uh, the gravity of the water scarcity problem is far worse in Yemen than it is in even other water scarce states in the Middle East region. And we all know that for the most part, the Middle East is a parched region, or you could say the MENA region, Middle East and North Africa, with the exception of maybe Turkey and Iran, but even those states that were more water abundant have come and have experienced their own problems in recent years. So just to put this in a comparative spec perspective, the per capita water availability in Yemen is only 125 cubic meters per year, uh, as compared with a global aver average of 2,500 cubic meters per year. But maybe the best reference point is the Middle East itself, the region of which Yemen is uh, a part. Uh, well, the per capita water availability, the average per capita water availability across the region as a whole is something like 1,250 1, cubic meters per year. So even in an extremely water stressed region, Yemen's plight is even far, far worse. And what is contributing to, or what, what's you know um, creating a crisis situation is that groundwater is being extracted at four times the rate of natural recharge. In other words, it's being used far more uh, quickly and intensively than it can be replenished. And in fact, uh, this, this pattern of unsustainable groundwater mining, as they call it, is making it so that the capital, Sana'a, is at risk of running bone dry, completely running out of water within uh, a decade. Now, granted, that prediction was made several years ago, so maybe it'll take a decade more before that comes to fruition, but 
it's at a very, very, um, it, it, it's just a terrible dilemma all around. Uh, I'm gonna show you a quick video about uh, which, which elaborates a little bit on some of the, the facts that I discussed. Uh, let me go ahead and I had to pop out and share the screen again. So just one second to do it. It's very, very quick video. Um, I'm sorry, let's see. I thought it would be, okay, here we go. Just one sec. Uh, okay, let me maximize this and just rewind it a teeny bit. Here we go. Yemen is one of the most impoverished countries in the world, but its capital, Sana'a, might just become the first capital in the world to run out of water in about a decade, according to analysts. Nature is struggling to reproduce enough water from the ground to satisfy a population of 23 million, which is predicted to double in the next two decades. Right now we are suffering from a crisis. We are struggling to provide water to more than 60% of the population of the capital, who are not covered by the local infrastructure for water and sanitation. There are a number of reasons one of which is the difficulty in finding enough sources to supply the amount of water that is required. Residents complain about the lack of adequate water supply for their daily activities. They also talk of tiring from transporting water from the wells to their homes. Some of these wells are at a depth that requires the use of oil drilling equipment, while others have become useless because of the sinking water table. While some residents remain optimistic about the government's ability to supply the rest of the country with enough water, local water expert Enwar Sahuli of the German company GTZ, which is responsible for water projects in Yemen, believes officials have yet to realize the gravity of the situation, saying a potential national war could erupt over the resource. He says that certain regulations and restrictions have been passed but have yet to be properly enforced, especially in the agricultural sector, which accounts for 90% of water usage upon cultivating the qat plant, used as a mild narcotic by local men. Sahuli, along with analysts, believes Yemen needs more efficient alternatives in water consumption and conservation. But if the current situation fails to witness any feasible improvement, Yemenis will need to look towards other locations in the country or to its neighbors in a bid to quench their thirst. Nora Faraj, Al Arabiya. Okay, hopefully you could hear that well enough. Um, one second, I have to pop back into the slides. Okay, everybody can see the slides again. Okay, great. So why, uh, some more about why the water scarcity problem, um, you know, takes on, uh, well, special urgency in Yemen. Well, first, unlike let's say Turkey or Egypt or Israel or Jordan, Yemen has no real rivers or other major surface water supply to be contrasted with groundwater, right? It has no major surface water supply sources except for seasonal spate, which are flood irrigation flows, wadis and springs and other sources whose flow widely fluctuates from season to season. And also Yemen has limited availability to take advantage of or cultivate alternative water supply sources, such as desalination, which uh, we could talk about later. And also uh, water scarcity is absolutely and positively uh, a driver of violence, arguably no longer the you know the biggest driver of violence since the civil war broke out but predating the civil war the government of yemen estimated that the casualties stemming from land and water disputes uh actually amounted to at least four thousand people per year right so that's pretty that's pretty extreme um so violent clashes resulting from competition for scarce water supplies is becoming increasingly lethal uh, also water related tensions or discord serve as a threat multiplier that aggravate uh, existing fault lines in divisions in Yemeni society. Nearly half of the documented cases of intertribal conflict in Yemen are related to clashes over land and water resources. 
And finally, I mean, Yemen's economic viability going forward hinges upon reliable access to sufficient water supplies in light of the fact that agriculture accounts for 15% of gross domestic product, employs 75% of the world workforce. And as the video clip that I showed you underscored, uh, agriculture accounts for 90% of the country's total water consumption. Uh, therefore, the wholesale collapse of aquifer systems would spell nothing short of disaster for a country with an already severely degraded capacity to weather economic shocks. Now, I just wanted to show you briefly a map of Yemen. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. It's at the, the southern tip of the Arabian Peninsula. And um, Yemen has some strategic value. I mean, especially when you take into consideration the fact that it's located by the Gulf of Aden uh, in the Red Sea. And there's a, a strategic uh, strait or waterway called the Bab el Mandeb, which connects the Arabian Peninsula, uh, the, sorry, the Arabian Sea and the Gulf of Aden to the Red Sea and onto the Suez Canal. So this is an important choke point for the flow of oil and other natural resources. And that's why um, Yemen has become an object of contention uh, for other, you know, for regional powers like Saudi Arabia and so forth. And Saudi Arabia is Yemen's uh, neighbor to the north and uh, it's bordered on the northeast by, by Oman. I just wanted to situate the geography of Yemen here and its strategic value. This has nothing to do with water, but I just wanted to show you because whenever we think of Yemen, it evokes very negative associations and images, you know, terrorism, civil war, uh, strife and so forth. But Yemen, I think it's also important to point out that it's a country with a beautiful heritage as well. The old city of Sana'a, the capital uh, is a UNESCO World Heritage uh, Site. And they have these very stately multi-story buildings that I think are made out of mud brick or something like that. But anyway, I just wanted to draw attention to something positive about Yemen as well, since unfortunately almost all of this talk is bad news. I hate to say it. Um, so what are some broad patterns? Let's dig a little bit into the contributing factors to water scarcity and conflict in Yemen. Um, it's important to take into account that Yemen does uh, kind of have a very sophisticated legal, institutional, and administrative framework in place for trying to curb water scarcity and regulating water consumption. Um, and in fact, I'll get to this in a few minutes, but there was a water law that was passed in the 1990s uh, that consisted of extensive regu regulations designed to curb illegal well drilling op operations, along with a system of penalties to punish and deter uh, violators. And so the design of the water reforms was adequate, but where the problem lies is in the implementation, the very inadequate, insufficient implementation of these water sector reform initiatives, which have overwhelmingly failed to shift the overall incentive structure away from unsustainable groundwater mining. Um, despite all of these regulations that were, um, that were adopted to uh, impose licensing requirements on the operators of drilling rigs who drill deep wells you know, in, in Yemen, uh, there's widespread evasion of these regulations. Uh, and therefore, water scarcity and the violence that accompanies it continues uh, unabated. Uh, these regulations as well designed as they are on paper have had very little discernible impact on water user behavior. So let's look at some underlying factors. Why are Yemen's institutional initiatives and innovations to rein in groundwater uh, over consumption and combat water-related violence performing so poorly? Well, one, factor that I think is about very important to draw attention to relates to the erosion of traditional norms and processes of conflict resolution, which were rooted in tribal and customary law. The legitimacy of the traditional tribal system of conflict resolution, resolution which you could say once upon a time worked very well throughout the centuries, was underpinned by the role of tribal leaders or sheikhs who were, um, developed a reputation for being very impartial. Uh, their authority to settle disputes and by extension, their legitimacy derived from their social position in the community, their knowledge, their extensive knowledge of customary rights and duties and their reputation for fairness and impartiality. They were known as being honest brokers, right? Uh, for 
brokering equitable arrangements, whatever uh, land and water disputes arose, right? Now, the problem though, is that in the Republic of Yemen, a lot of sheikhs were, to put it kind of crudely, they were essentially bought off by the government of Yemen. They became alienated from the tribal communities whose needs they once responded to through their absorption, and you could say co-optation into the national political structure. Um, and sort of as a form of patronage, you know, many tribal leaders took advantage of their enhanced political status to lock in lucrative economic opportunities and sources of wealth, including large tracts of land and the surrounding water resources, okay? So as a result, you know, the sheikhs were no longer able to and are still no longer able to serve as impartial, credible mediators in land and water disputes because they basically become parties to many, many of these land and water disputes, right? Uh, the, the, the very disputes that they used to settle uh, in a very even-handed fashion. So you could be talking about your, what we're talking about here are blatant conflicts of interest. Uh, if, if you thought the conflicts of interest, you know, involving, let's say, uh, Justice Clarence Thomas and his wife were acute, well, this pales in comparison to the conflicts of interest that we see here, right? So the problem is the sheikhs, whenever a, a, a sorry, a, a land or water dispute breaks out, they basically have a vested interest in the out in the outcome of that dispute because due to their ownership of land in, in water. Uh, so their reputation as honest brokers has suffered quite a beating. Um, and at the same time, there's been no comprehensive and credible system, no modern system for conflict resolution that's taken its place that Yemenis uh, have you know, enough faith in, right? So basically the decay of the traditional system of tribal resolution left a void, but this void has uh, not been filled adequately by you could say more modern mechanisms of conflict resolution. Um, many Yemenis have little faith in the, in the ability of courts to apply the law fairly. Thus, they tend to bypass uh, official outlets for conflict resolution. There's a real credibility gap here, a credibility gap. So even in the Sana'a plain, where national institutions are relatively accessible, Sana'a being the capital city, the overwhelming majority of respondents, a 96% to a field survey, expressed a clear preference for local and tribal arbitration systems over civil courts when water disputes arose. Uh, the reason why the farmers who were surveyed were wary of resorting to courts to press their claims in water disputes was first due to concerns over the excessive cost of claims. And often you need to be willing and able to shower you know, officials with extensive bribes in order to negotiate the system. Also the process uh, of arbitration of water disputes in the courts is very slow and cumbersome. And even when you know, they decide to go all the way with this conflict resolution system uh, and decisions are, are, are rendered by judges, uh, the enforcement of these decisions tends to be very spotty and uneven. So the net result is that protagonists of water disputes have little faith in the impartiality of judges due to their propensity to engage in favoritism on tribal or other grounds, according to the International Crisis Group's report on this in 2003. Um, now, it's important to keep in mind, and you know, I did conduct interviews with uh, ministers and government officials, former government officials who were in charge of the water portfolio you know, in Yemen. I think I got the overwhelming sense, and the literature seems to um, corroborate this, that institutions and water sector managers in Yemen are competent and committed, but they just don't have the requisite backing they need from the state to enforce their mandates. They don't have the support they need from the governing apparatus, right, from high-level Yemeni officials. And we're talking about a, a, a point, I mean, we're, we're, now we're talking about a time, though, before predating the Civil War, when there actually was the semblance of a functioning government however corrupt right, it, it might have been, right? So let's talk a little about the water law. That was the landmark uh, water sector or landmark package of water sector reform initiatives that was adopted in 2002. The National Water Resources Agency, which from here on out, I'll abbreviate as the NWRA, was placed in charge of uh, enforcing the water law. 
What were the purposes of the water law? Well, first, to register and codify water rights, formalize water rights, in order to prevent private appropriation of communal resources. And number two, and this has been perhaps the single biggest contributor to water scarcity, to try to rein in illegal well drilling, illegal drill drilling of wells and slow the rate of groundwater depletion, partly by instituting procedures for licensing and the registration of operators of the drilling rigs, the heavy equipment that's used to drill these deep wells, right? So the consensus is that the water law is well-designed, but poorly executed, very patchily implemented, and often outright subverted. Now, the glass half full, the water law, I don't know if these gains have been reversed since then, but the water law for a time was registering some successes. Within a matter of years, according to my interview with Mohammed al Ariani, the former head of the Ministry of Water and Environment, almost 90 well drilling contractors registered the equipment with the state. They abided by that set of regulations. Um, and in Taiz, which is a, a city in, in, in Southwest Yemen, indiscriminate illicit drilling was at one point brought 80% under control and a hotline that allowed citizens to immediately notify authorities of illegal well drilling operations had been widely employed, had been widely used. So it seems like for a time they were kind of chipping away, uh, making progress, making headway towards uh, resolving or addressing this problem of illegal wall drilling. Uh, yet, unfortunately, the glass half empty is that the shortcomings of the implementation process absolutely dwarf the few successes. Uh, individual landowners, especially powerful, well-connected landowners, are rarely held to account for violations of the provisions in the water law related to the licensing and registration of drilling rigs. So for example, the World Bank in 2007, they said, Despite 141 citations being issued for illegal drilling, illegal drilling, sorry, in the Sanaa Basin, only two, only two out of those 141 violations were prosecuted. And so far, no action has resulted, right? So maybe not even a slap on the wrist in those cases. And the NWRA's authority to impose sanctions uh, is undermined due to the absence of coercive powers at its disposal. It just doesn't have any teeth to punish you know, violators of these uh, provisions related to uh, licensing and registration of drilling rigs. Uh, many experts say that in order for the NWRA to have succeeded in achieving a task as daunting as forcing a halt to unlicensed well drilling activities in a nation long accustomed to viewing water as an open access resource, financial penalties needed to be, be backed by the credible threat of force. They needed to have some teeth, right? However, given its status, given the status of the NWRA uh, as a civil institution without the coercive powers of the state at its disposal, the NWRA needed to rely on cooperation from the state security forces to impose its will when violations occurred. However, coordination between the NWRA and the state security apparatus was never, was never strong. It was, it was always weak, right? It's always been weak. Therefore, that makes it almost impossible for the NWRA to bring violators of the water law to heel, let alone deter future violations, right? This is based also on my interview with Dr. Mohammed uh, Alhamdi, the previously mentioned uh, former Minister of Water uh, and in the environment. And um, so also the problem is that there's a shadow government uh, in, in, in Yemen. I mean, especially before the civil war, but probably still the case, uh, where basically uh, there were many, many high level officials and land and water owners, large you know owners of land and water resources who were just simply unaccountable, who had felt no inclination whatsoever to, to answer to uh, the authorities, to the NWRA, right? And so this also undermined the efforts of bureaucrats and technocrats to implement the law in good faith. Um, Al Ariani argued that the NWRA and the Ministry of Water and Environment's sincere efforts to enforce compliance 
with the registration and licensing pro pro procedures, I'm sorry, provisions of the water law may have met with greater success, may have been more successful, were it not for some drilling contractors who were on the loose and roamed around and could not be brought under the law. He added that the ministry, uh, that these drilling contractors basically took advantage of their political connections to uh, you know, high level people in the regime, uh, you know, people in the upper echelon of, of power to evade regulation or even uh, detection. According to Al Ariani, the ministry was not even aware of the existence of some of these contractors, these uh, drilling rig contractors, right? Which included sheikhs, once again, you know, tribal leaders, members of parliament, powerful businessmen, and influential community leaders. So, I mean, this was reflective of a larger problem when Ali Abdullah Saleh was president, who was toppled in you know, the Arab Spring protests of 2011, where there was a really real blurring of the lines between people with economic status and the power structure of the regime. And so people who were wealthy, you know, large uh, landowners and who owned the water resources uh, on that land basically abused or exploited their economic status political clout uh, and connections with the regime to skirt the law and shield their activities from NWRAs, from the NWRA scrutiny and oversight. So we're talking about people, you know, people who contribute the most to groundwater overdraft into the illegal drilling of deep wells who were the most unaccountable, right? Um, and most disturbingly, even members of the government itself engaged in illegal well drilling, what we call water wildcatting in blatant violation of the water law. So according to Mohammed El Hamdi, a former head of the Ministry of Water and Environment, the Minister of the Interior was drilling an unlicensed well in his private home in the middle of the city at the same time that a cabinet resolution banning all further drillings within the Sana'a Basin went into effect. So basically just completely thumbing his nose at the law and at the authorities and refusing to comply with any of these, um, with any of these regulations, right? Designed to curb uh, unsustainable groundwater use. Now, another factor I'd like to bring attention to is the notion of legal pluralism. I mean, I believe that this is one of the key pieces of the puzzle that has not been adequately accounted for in previous scholarship but which may actually sort of in a way trump or even uh, subsume, you know, uh, kind of like overshadow many of the other factors that I previously identified as principal causes of Yemen's dysfunctional approach to water management. Um, so simply stated in Yemen, there's a bewildering array of competing legal standards and traditions with conflicting interpretations of key questions concerning uh, water resource rights and, and allocations. So there are different legal standards that, it, uh, that have different perspectives or different standards uh, on key questions such as the relationship between land ownership uh, and rights of access to groundwater uh, resources. Uh, also, whether groundwater can be appropriated for private use, for private consumption versus being a property of the state or a public trust. So for instance, one author named Caton uh, wrote, uh, argued that whereas the constitution stipulates that groundwater is the property of the state, in other words, a public trust that cannot be appropriated for private use, the civil code, which is supposed to be in conformity with the Sharia, with the corpus of Islamic law, allows for the possibility of private ownership of water resources. In other words, by drilling a well, water can be appropriated, uh, converted into private use through containment in a well, right? So this situation, this patchwork quilt of competing and conflicting legal standards, this legal pluralism creates a situation where basically it makes it ex extremely difficult for water managers to enforce the law. It leaves them with inadequate uh, guidance uh, regarding you know, how uh, water rights are supposed to be assigned and how water uh, is supposed to be allocated and to what extent uh, you know, private operators can use water, can appropriate water and siphon off water 
uh, for their own uh, benefit. And I would argue that this legal pluralism uh, is in many respects more responsible for the fragmented nature of water governance in Yemen, including the inadequate implementation of the water law than practically uh, any other factor. And see what happens is that powerful players, you know, people who own huge tracts of land and the water beneath it, uh, take advantage of this legal amb ambiguity, right? This legal pluralism to basically appropriate as, as much water for private use as they please, right? It allows them, it gives them an opening to muscle in on the water resources of weaker actors or to drill deep wells uh, that dry up the shallower wells of their weaker neighbors. So this is, provides an enabling environment for what is often called resource capture. Now, I'm moving on to a different segment uh, about the Civil War. So the Civil War, uh, don't have time to talk about that in an exhaustive sense, but the Civil War has primarily pitted uh, the Houthi movement, which is a populist, religious, revivalist movement that hails from the Zaydi Shia branch of Islam against this Saudi-led coalition of Sunni, Sunni Arab states and their local allies. Once again, the Shia Sunni divide rears its ugly head again, right? In early 2015, the insurgency spearheaded by the Houthis gained ground and they basically took control of Sana'a, the capital city, which led to the effective toppling and flight into exile of the internationally recognized government of President Abdurrabu, uh, Abdurrabu, I think would be a better way to pronounce it, Mansur al Hadi. Uh, the Houthi seizure of power can in part be attributed to their successful street mobilizations and their efforts, their successful efforts to capitalize on the economic and political grievances of, uh, of, of Yemenis, right? Uh, grievances such as falling liver, living standards, lack of economic opportunity, continued corruption, and the failure of the Hadi government, of President Hadi and his government to deliver on promised economic and political reform. So basically, the Arab Spring Revolution, which led to the overthrow of the government of Ali Abdullah Saleh, the long-standing, you know, strong man in, in Yemen in 2011, uh, which then led to this power transition arrangement in which Hadi took power. You know, basically, uh, Yemeni's hopes were raised that this would mark a new beginning for Yemen in terms of expanded economic opportunities, uh, the end of corruption, good governance, and uh, those promises. Uh, lofty promises just didn't pan out. And so uh, a lot of people started agitating against the Al-Hadi government and the Houthi was very adept at capitalizing on that popular frustration. And that's what allowed them to come into power. Um, make a long story short, uh, the Houthis resting control of Sana'a uh, prompted uh, a backlash from the Sunni Arab states in the region. Saudi Arabia swung into action, action it organized a coalition with prominent allies, including especially, I should say, the United Arab Emirates. They organized a military intervention aimed at restoring the government of President Hadi and ousting the Houthis and their allies from power. Uh, the Saudi-led coalition drew upon various forms of diplomatic, material, and military assistance from the U.S., including weapons transfers, mid-air fueling, targeting intelligence, and the like. Now, more um, relevant to our purposes, uh, the airstrikes and blockades imposed by the Saudis and their allies, well, let's just say the vast majority of these attacks were indiscriminate. They resulted in high civilian casualties. The displacement of millions of Yemenis um, and widespread material damage and destruction uh, to agricultural or disruption, I should say, to agricultural productivity, as well as the outright destruction of water supply infrastructure. And in fact, the damage and destruction of water supply networks led to an outbreak of a waterborne disease, cholera, in Yemen in 2017. And unhappily, this has actually been widely noted as being the worst cholera epidemic in modern history. Uh, there have been over 1.2 million suspected cases and 3,000 deaths to date. And much of this can be directly attributed to the destruction of water sanitation and hygienic infrastructure since the start of the bombing campaign perpetrated by Saudi Arabia and its partners in 2015. So just a brief discussion, and here's some photos here of the 
Saudi airstrikes, the Saudi-led airstrikes. This is a photo of the uh, ousted president of Yemen, but one who still enjoys the recognition of much of the international community, uh, Abdul Rabo Mansour al-Hadi. Uh, this is a picture of the leader of the um, of the Houthi movement, Abdul Malik Badruddin uh, al Houthi. Um, so just to give you uh, a, a quick overview of the extent of the damage to agricultural infrastructure and water supply services in Yemen as a result of the Saudi-led bombing campaign, according to a report from the Houthi-controlled Ministry of Agriculture and Irrigation, in just a seven-month period, seven-month period in 2015, nearly 100 poultry farms were destroyed and over 50,000 head of livestock were lost in just a seven-month period. Saudi-led uh, air raids, the, the, the coalition air raids targeted almost a thousand fields, a hundred wells and water pumps, and razed or damaged over 300, uh, sorry, over 3,500 greenhouses, overwhelmingly in Saada government. Now the significance of Saada, Saada which is a province in the Northwest, is that this, this area is the heartland of the Houthi movement. According to Al Saidi Roach and Al Saidi, I think that's how you pronounce it, some of the independent water utilities or local corporations who provided water services, water services at the local level were forced to halt some of their operations after the onset of the civil war due to damaged infrastructure, infrastructure being damaged beyond repair, unpaid customer debt, and scarcity of energy, and just, um, you know, the backdrop to this is that you really cannot operate the, the water uh, services, you can't operate water supply services in Yemen without reliable access to sufficient energy supplies. Because um, as I've said before, Yemen's drinking water supply largely relies on the extraction of groundwater, which in turn requires abundant uh, amounts of energy for diesel run generators, pumps, and well drilling equipment. So when you have an energy supply crisis, well, inevitably you're going to have a water supply crisis as well. And that's precisely what's happened in Yemen. Um, and due to the extensive damage sustained to the water and sanitation infrastructure and the deterioration of services, many Yemenis have reduced their reliance on public water services, on public water services in terms of alternative supply services. So more and more households are just settling for individual, you know, micro level of approaches to getting their water supply needs fulfilled. Uh, they're relying increasingly on private wells, uh, water tankers, which, which in, in the water that's provided by local water tankers is incredibly expensive. And even localized community organized uh, water harvesting techniques, including man-made cisterns, ponds and rooftop water harvesting, as a substitute for public water networks, which have been damaged you know, significantly and which no longer uh, provide an adequate amount of water. Uh, and as you might expect, uh, the extent of water, uh, the coverage of water and sanitation services has uh, witnessed the, has experienced the sharpest deterioration in the very cities that have borne the brunt of the fighting and who've experienced the greatest damage from Saudi coalition airstrikes, including Sana'a, uh, Aden, uh, Hodeida, and Taiz, which are among the biggest population centers in, in Yemen. Um, now, I mean, to what extent was were water-related tensions or water scarcity uh, a, a, a significant contributing factor to the outbreak uh, of the civil war in 2015? To what extent did water, in other words, contribute to the rise of the Houthi movement? and their emergence as a dominant political force in post-Civil War Yemen. I mean, it's difficult to make the case that this was the decisive cause of the Civil War, because I'm, there were definitely a whole host of other factors which you know, eclipsed the role of water scarcity. First of all, the sectarian grievances that the Houthis represented as an oppressed uh, movement of Shia, uh, as well as the sectarian animosity that they're takeover of Sana'a triggered, you know, this triggered the whole uh, Sunni, Shia versus Sunni divide. Then we, you know, in that same context, we have to look at regional power struggles, uh, one that pits 
uh, the Shia powerhouse of the region, if you will, Iran versus its uh, uh, Sunni Arab uh, rivals, you know, Saudi Arabia and the UAE primarily. And then as we talked about before, there was the whole fallout from the Arab Spring uprising of 2011 and the dashed expectations of the transition led by President Hadi, the fact that um, just the way that he governed did not, that fell well short of Yemeni's expectations after the Arab Spring uprising. Nonetheless, it is noteworthy that Saada, which is the government, uh, sorry, government located in Northern Yemen, which is the heartland of the Houthi movement, was among the most water stressed regions of the country. Uh, unsustainable groundwater use was very acute in, in, in Saada. And as a result, the water table dropped uh, precipitously, very sharply in the Saada basin in the 1990s. So according to one article uh, written, authored by al Sakaf et al., they reported an extensive decline in groundwater levels in the Saada region during the 1980s and 1990s as the number of drilling wells dramatically expanded. And in fact, between 1993 and 2001, groundwater extraction doubled from 45 to 90 million cubic meters, almost a doubling in just eight years, right? That's unbelievable. While the rate of recharge or replenishment of the water supply dropped by 30% to 7 million cubic meters. So we're talking about an increasing imbalance, right? Between the rate of consumption and the rate of recharge or replenishment. This essentially resulted in the exhaustion or outright collapse of the most active zone of the aquifer in Saada as early as 1998. And as a result, you know, inevitably what followed were crop failures, losses of livelihoods, economic migration, born of you know, economic desperation. Uh, so we're talking about pretty adverse socioeconomic consequences that uh, flowed from the over-exploitation of groundwater resources. Now there's no definitive link here and the jury is still out on how all these factors you know, connect or, or tie together but it's quite possible that these uh, adverse consequences that stem from groundwater overuse in Sada might have expanded the ranks of Houthis, made it easier for them to recruit and also increase their appeal and their, their reach overall, right? Uh, but I'm not saying that there's any definitive relationship between these factors and it has yet to be, uh, it, it, it requires more thorough study and that's where I'd like to go with my research in the future. Now, I would just like to, um, I'd like to leave enough time for Q&A. So I'm just gonna summarize a couple last points. We could talk about this more in the Q&A if you're interested, but you know, you might, what might be the most, the burning like $64,000 question on your mind? Well, what are the solutions to Yemen's, you know, desperate water situation? Um, I would just say initially that it's hard to see any fundamental reforms taking shape, such as improving governance and management performance of the water sector, uh, as long as the civil war is raging. I mean, the destruction of the water supply network has to stop, right? And Yemen has to be able to get some breathing space to pursue further reforms uh, if, if water resources are going to be managed more effectively. In order to accomplish that, there needs to be at, at minimum, a pause in the fighting, if not an outright cessation of the violence altogether. Um, but there's also other factors which stand in the way of Yemen's ability to enact comprehensive water sector reforms anytime in the near future, even assuming that the, the civil war was to come to a screeching halt and a peaceful settlement could be established between the conflicting parties. Um, desalination is not a very uh, cost-effective or feasible option. I could elaborate on that in the Q&A if, if you're interested. Economic diversification might be one way, uh, one possible solution to uh, Yemen's predicament. I mean, kind of easier said than done, but there are some avenues by which they could diversify their economy. And uh, Yemen certainly could adopt more measures, could adopt more, uh, well, undertake more concerted effort to shift their focus away from water intensive crops, including this one staple crop called Qat. Qat is basically a mild stimulant, 
which is used by many Yemenis for social and other purposes. And it's the leading agricultural crop. It's widely popular, but the problem is that cot has crowded out cultivation of cot, uh, which makes up 30 to 40% of Yemen's total available irrigation water, has crowded out productions of edible, of edible uh, crops like fruits, vegetable, coffee, and other staple food commodities. And if Yemen were to shift its um, water resources from cultivation of cut, which is not edible, it's, you know, you use it to kind of get high, but it's not edible to these staple food crops, then that might have the dual benefit of not only reducing um, the burden on its diminishing water resources, but secondly, uh, it would allow Yemen to reduce its vulnerability on food imports, right? On a very volatile uh, worldwide food uh, supply market, a worldwide food market, right? Which has become only more volatile in the wake of the start of the, uh, the, the war in Ukraine. And so I think that that's, that's good for now. Uh, I will gladly, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll gladly yield the floor to, to, to you and, and, and your students and allow you to ask whatever questions come to mind. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Weiss. Please join me thanking him. Uh, let me, since the, the, we, we, we are in a classroom, I just want to open the floor. And since you guys are sitting in front of your laptop computers, we can hear you. So please raise your hand, unmute yourself when you have the permission and go ahead and share your questions. Who has a question? I, I can also moderate any questions from the chat as well, if people can't are in a place where they can't unmute themselves. Thank you very much, Dr. Zimmerman. Thank you. And we have one in the chat right now. Okay. From Nathan Todd. Okay. Oh, should I read it? Um, or did you want to narrate it? Uh, I, I can definitely uh, read it. So from Nathan, he says, while I understand that illegal water mining is a major contributor to water scarcity, you mentioned that there were some policies that placed limitations on water consumption. To what extent does insufficient cons inefficient consumption of water contribute to the water crisis and what policies were put in place to limit water consumption? Oh, to limit water consumption. Okay. <coughs> um, let me think about this. Well, I mean, I think that though Extraction, I, I mean, extraction is sort of organically connected to consumption. If you extract water at a sustainable rate using sustainable methods in a way that you could allow for the replenishment of the water table, then, you know, I think like it only follows that uh, consumption would be, would be regulated somehow, would be regulated, well regulated as well. Um, and then you know, I, I, so I don't think like, if anything, actually, I mean, because of the severe deterioration of the groundwater supply and the groundwater supply infrastructure and the fact that the water table has dropped so precipitously, I think that that's what's, that's what's responsible for the fact that Yemen has the lowest water uh, availability per capita practically in the world and certainly, and certainly in the region. Uh, but I think like the, the problem is that the vast majority of the water is being hoarded by agriculture, right? And so that's where the biggest problem, it's not so much drinking water, drinking water needs and sanitation and hygienic needs that's putting a disproportionate burden on the water supply, but it's rather the, uh, the you know, you could say outlandish or excessive amount of water that's being used for agriculture. So as I spoke about, well, just very much in passing in the last slide, there have been um, certain regulations that have been passed to, to limit the, the cultivation of, of cot, right? In many regions of Yemen, that the mild stimulant that many Yemenis use on, on a daily basis. Uh, but, those, but those regulations have not been well adhered to. There's this, in fact, some people speak of, of, of a cot mafia, right? That has like a stranglehold on cot and is determined, determined to ensure that cot continues to be consumed and cultivated in enormous quantities, you know, for as long as they can 
going forward. So I think that if there was more effective implementation of these of these regulations related to Sakat cultivation, if it was sharply curtailed, and if I, as I said before, uh, more water resources were redirected to staple food crops, then I think like cons consumption could be brought more into line with availability, right? I hope that answers your, your question. Thank you so much, Dr. Weiss. Just briefly interrupting, would you please uh, 